Now, it's the start of a new year, and we're looking at what we can expect from the tech and fintech space here in Nigeria to discuss the trends that will shape these sectors in West Africa, and particularly in Nigeria. My guests are Austin Okere, founder of CWG PLC, an entrepreneur in residence at the Columbia Business School, and Olushola Tenyola, president of the Association of Telecommunications Companies of Nigeria. Gentlemen, welcome. Good morning, and a happy new year to you. Thank you so much Likewise. for being our very first guests for Beyond Markets this year. So we did talk about trends in fintech and technology last year. We saw uh, a bit of uh, that, you know, huge buzz around blockchain, around Bitcoin, and we saw financial services sector. We saw that disruption also. Fintech companies providing apps and making the banking a lot easier and you know, easily accessible to to uh, customers. Let me start with you, <laughs> Austin. Look into your crystal ball and tell us what you see. Perhaps as if that will come, that could come first a major disruptor in the tech space this year? Um, I think I will, I will list fintech uh, definitely as one. Uh, secondly, big data and AI together. And the application of, of these in education, if you look at the, the education space and the big gap that we have there, uh, classroom to teacher ratios and even the opportunity of taking that outside the class and being able to use the mobile phone to extend education a bit more widely. And, and also health. Um, what's, what stops us from using our, uh, speaking, our talk data credit to pay a premium to an HMO, to an insurance company, such that when we are ill, we can get treatment. And that, that way you are democratizing the whole HMO space a bit more wider than the narrow space in which we're operating with it now. Okay, so for education, you're expecting that to begin to take root. Uh, I'm thinking perhaps that, did that already start in 2017? Is, that, is it going to be a continuation of that in 2018? Or is that going to be better expanded in 2018? I think it started way beyond. I mean, in my work at Columbia Business, with some of the things that we look at, is how to make sure that education does not remain restricted to only the elite. I mean, if you take a typical MBA course, $70,000 per, per session, uh, what about putting courseware on uh, the platforms for people to register and only when they take exam are they charged a certain amount? May come to about 6000 to get a degree, may take a bit of a longer okay, time. So online resources available Co yes. online on certain so platforms. So MIT does that, Harvard does that. Um, but do we have that here in Nigeria? We, we thought about having something like that on the open university system, but I'm not so sure that we have applied the technology to it. Even though we call it open university, people still go somewhere. The whole idea is for us to use that platform, the technology platform, with broadband and courseware and online teachers mm. and willing students, and then make a proper uh, arrangement for them to register for exams and take the exams and get a degree. You know, uh, in that case, it's not going to be a three year. It's your, it's at your pace, okay. and when you're ready for the exam. You know, in as much as we're going to be looking and talking about trends, global trends, I want us also, you know, see how that is also taking root here in Nigeria. Shola, let me come to you. What, 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 what are your predictions, or what are your forecasts for how uh, there will be disruption in the fintech or tech space? I think, uh, taking it from the tech space, I think cloud computing and the cloud technology will start to uh, increase and grow in the way and manner we actually store our data and the way we actually process information. So I believe now that we have a number of tier three data centers already uh, in the country. Uh, there'll be uh, definitely improvement in connectivity to those data centers. So the interoperability of those data centers to other data centers that reside outside the country I, the, prob the public hybrid model will start to increase. That will allow uh, a lot of the data that we have now to start to be manipulated, uh, to start to do predictive analysis and behavior, and that speaks to AI to a degree. I also think that some of the trials that have started, the Internet of Things that were done in South Africa, smart metering, uh, things to do with smart farming, also to do with security, you know, I think that they were looking in South Africa at uh, uh, putting devices, embedded devices into rhinos just to, because of the extension and the poaching. We could also use those type of uh, technologies in terms of uh, 
the cattle, you know, and uh, to see how they migrate. You know, we also have a uh, food security issue, you know, in some parts of the country due to climate change. So I think that you will find that uh, that's an area that we could look at and uh, start to benefit from. Also, I also think that uh, the cyber security area uh, is going to be a big one for 2018. I think that. When you uh, say a big one, a big problem or uh, better solutions? No, better be ways solution. to There's tackle There's always it. solutions. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think that uh, the, the, the numbers of millions of users now on social media and other platforms would render cybersecurity and the, the safety of the users on those platforms uh, uh, an area for us to look at. And then finally, I think that blockchain, the technology itself, is, is starting to grow some legs. I think that uh, it will improve in terms of its uh, usage of CPU power. I think that's one usage. of the... Usage, what about understanding? Uh, the understanding will always come. I think that uh, in Africa, and generally I can speak for Nigeria, I think we are slight, somewhat behind. I think that uh, the, it's been driven from the um, Asia Pacific. Uh, I think that there's a huge uptake in... Uh, the blockchain technology and uh, now it's starting to creep into our financial institutions. Uh, so I think fintech, as mm. Austin has uh, also indicated, is a, is a big one. Uh, I think there's a, I, I call them legs, you know, we still need to exercise caution. I mean, I'll agree with you on that one, to, legs. As I as mean, especially towards the end of last year. It was just incredible, especially, I mean, I know Bitcoin, uh, blockchain is this technology that supports the likes of Bitcoin and the rest of that, but, you know, there was more focus on the Bitcoin and the, the other coins out there. I on the valuation and of the valuation. cryptocurrency <laughs> than actually technology, but the technology itself has a lot of legs in terms of mm. the areas that it can help the African, uh, Africa to solve African problems. I think that, yes, there's one area where you're making money, but I think there's another area where it can improve a lot of the way we actually transact uh, payments and the way we actually transact business on a day-to-day -day basis. So there's a lot of areas for disruption. Well, so let me come to you. Let's talk about, I mean, the blockchain. Uh, Shola's talked about the fact that, I mean, for 2018 for Nigeria, there was a lot of focus on, I mean, the money aspect, making money and all mm. of that. I'm thinking other ways that we can deploy this technology for corporates, even, you know, startups, SMEs. I think we, we associate blockchain to Bitcoin as if they are two sides of a coin. But blockchain goes way beyond Bitcoin or the money aspect. Take, for instance, property. The way in which we can release capital is if property is properly registered. Uh, property is registered in Lagos mainly, and so people can transact and use their property as collateral and get a loan. Go beyond Lagos to the suburbs and to the villages. People have land, but they can never use it to release capital in order to, to start a business. And what blockchain does, and EY has done it, is to use it as a property ledger and even selling fractional properties. Now that we're talking about uh, food security and a food basket and talking about ranching, the best way to, to accelerate property registration is really using blockchain technology, you know, and um, it's, it looks difficult. It looks because that, that's what's going through my mind right now. That the de deployment of this technology is this something? Do we have the required knowledge? Those who are going to be using it, I don't know, corporate or whoever it's going to benefit. Do they have the understanding in terms of how they can be even just not just knowing how to use it, but be innovative in the way that they use it? With with everything, you need to put in effort. I mean, you cannot make progress without moving your feet. I remember when we we're going to change our accounting system from GAS to IFRS. We all thought it was going to be impossible. Today, nobody is using that. We're using RFIs. I remember when we're going to go from um, what we're doing to internet and internet shopping. People were very reluctant to put their card data online to shop anything. Today, True. people more people <laughs> shop online than offline. And in the same way, whatever it looks uh, uh, too sophisticated is because you have not gone into it to understand it and even to try and use it. And the, the, the use is going to come from those that most need it because they have the most uh, listen to use it. You need it and so you use it. I mean, ride hailing, for instance. You, if you don't need to have a car, you don't have a car, you try to use the ride hailing and then maybe it works for you or maybe it doesn't work for you. And most times it will work for you. It's the same as the blockchain. It's nothing more than a ledger. Okay. and ledger system, and anybody can use a ledger system. Ashola, you talked earlier about, I mean, data, storing data, that's the, uh, local, uh, local companies, you know, into that database. And I'm thinking, you said there's about three of them. <clears throat> Looking at the population of the country and the number of businesses that we have, do you see more businesses adopting 
you know, making use of these data centers to store? Because I'm just thinking three, four for a country of this size and the kind of on, you know, enterprises or you know, commerce that goes on in this country. I think that you're right in terms of the numbers. I think that there needs to be an increase in terms of maybe at least in one each geopolitical area of, of the country. But let's start with what we have right now. They're still underutilized. So there is a massive opportunity for the public to be made more aware that we have tier certified data centers in the country that are run on international standards and best practices. And therefore also that there's the connectivity and that's the important base that we feel that we do have a huge massive of undersea cables sitting on the shores of Lagos, but those cables are now at those data centers. So therefore, there isn't any need to now locate your data outside the country. You can do it inside the country. Then the next bit is to actually use this cloud technology to start processing the data that we have. You know, there's a huge amount of data that can be rendered and extracted for health purposes, and these are information that can assist doctors in terms of curing diseases that are pertinent to Nigeria or Africa. And those also underpins the and starts to embrace e-medicine. So, you know, we have to start from somewhere and I believe that those type of technologies are definitely one example of the wins that we can do utilizing the data centers. But remember, data is key. Data without, Absolutely. AI without data is not anything that uh, you, one can uh, actually use to the benefit of the citizens. Okay, I think we have about one minute before going break. Uh, uh, also, let me come to you. The financial services sector uh, in, in 2018, we've already seen that disruption, tech disruption, right from last year, before last year, but we did see uh, more of that in ha happening in 2017. But for 2018, how do you see the banks, the financial sector, better use, utilizing fintech? Do you think they're going to take it a lot more further than they did in 2017? Well, I'm not sure there's very much uh, choice for them because at the end of the day, you find that a lot of the customers are going more towards uh, fintech companies because they are reaching them. I mean, the bank is not coming. The market woman, like I say, is not poor, but she doesn't have time to go and queue in the bank and waste. Now, someone comes with an application on the phone and she can do her isusu or ajo more reliably on the phone. And it's not a bank at the other end, it's a fintech. And then she grows her business, she becomes, she becomes a big trader. And then she's already a customer of that fintech. You're not going to get her anymore. She's used to that. So the bank, I mean, Leo, uh, UBA just released what they call Leo, which is like a chatbot talking to customers uh, to make it more friendly, more e easier for customers to. Uh, and that's just the beginning. There's going to be a collaboration between fintechs and banks to make sure that that um, convenience and reaching more people at a, at a cheaper cost happens or the fintechs are going to run away with the game. It's up to the banks, really. I want us to pick up that, that thought when we come back from the break. Thank you so much for your time so far. I've been speaking to Austin Okere, founder, CWG PLC, an entrepreneur in residence at the Columbia Business School, and Olushola Teniola, president of the Association of Telecommunications Companies of Nigeria. So we continue our focus on trends that will shape tech and fintech in West Africa this year. Austin Okere, Founder CWG PLC and entrepreneur in residence at Columbia Business School is one of my guests. And of course, I also have Olushola Teniola, president of the Association of Telecommunications Companies of Nigeria. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for your time so far. Shola, let's kick off with you. Uh, telecom space, a lot has happened in the last one, over a decade, actually, especially here in Nigeria. But for the way tech is going to perhaps better transform the sector in 2018, give us a clue. Uh, I think, you know, with telecoms, and you said it's been here for a decade, it's been here for slightly longer, um, we've really played on the voice-centric space and now uh, we feel uh, that artificial intelligence is going to be dominant, not only in the way we deliver services, I think that uh, there's an opportunity which is vast to improve the way we interact with our customers, um, to understand the needs and the best way to actually optimize our network so that we can improve quality of service. I think in Africa that's a, a big one, knowing that we have a def deficit of infrastructure in, in the country. And the other area is really, really, it's basic, it's just to improve the speeds. I think that uh, uh, broadband in, in, in South Africa, sorry to refer to South Africa, but the recent trial uh, with uh, Ericsson and MTN, uh, depicted uh, speeds uh, per user of almost 155 megabits per second. You know, yeah. that's 
Oh, that huge is amount of speed for but one when, when particular say, user on a mobile device. So. Absolutely. But when you say artificial intelligence, I, I, I would like you to break it down. No problem. Okay, typical example for, yeah. the, you know, for our viewers out there. When you say AI yes. in that space this yes. year, break it down for us. So, for instance, you know that uh, on the mobile device we visit different websites and we do it as second nature. I think some people do certain routines in the morning. It's now the mobile device beside them and they access certain sites, they're giving away information as they do that. That information resides somewhere, and the last comment I made was there were data centers. Um, but those, those data, if they just remain there, sit there, there's a static. So they're dynamic data that's very interesting to the over-the-top over players. They can also be of interest to the operator themselves, not only in terms of understanding how you use your device and when you use it and for which sites you visit, okay. but also what you might want to do in the future. So there's a lot of collateral there as to knowing what you are going to do. And I think now you will see a lot of websites or your interaction with the internet be more personal because it's almost predicting what you feel you are about to do. And actually, it's behavior you've exhibited in the past. So there's a historical information and predictive information yeah. being put together. So that touches on the area of big data. But internally inside the telco space, within the operators, there's a, an amount of data that they can use to optimize the way they, they deliver the services, the way they deliver voice, the way they deliver um, the, uh, the sorry uh, data okay. and definitely looking at 5G. 5G is starting. I mean, we still have got to will that happen, have 4G. Will that happen for us? In I think this maybe year? in the, around 2020, 20, 2020, 2020 plus. Two more I years think yeah, two, two more years. The standards still need to be. But will any ground work for it? I mean, the frame. Some of the some of the operators have started to uh, prepare the networks okay. to be able to uh, take on 5G when it is ready for them to adopt it. Okay, fingers crossed on that one. Austin, where mm -hmm. we, we stopped of uh, fintech companies providing services. You, you gave the example of the market woman who is able to, you know, make a, do a transaction on her phone based, you know, her, with her, on her relationship with the fintech company. So I'm just wondering, where does that leave the financial institutions, the banks, who are also trying to adopt some of this uh, uh, tech? What happened in China was that the fintechs were going at their, at their banks, customers, and the, the, the banks still have the credibility of the customer base, long-term association trust, and, and, and it was like just going around circles. So the government now tried to get the fintechs to operate on their own, but bring the, the new technology to the bank and earn huge commissions or share of revenue from the banks using that technology. I think it's a good model, you know, because uh, a fintech may be too small to really make that big difference, unless it's grown or acquired other fintechs. What I think would be a good symbiosis is not for the banks to uh, absorb them because then they kill creativity and innovation, but for them to exist and offer services to the banks. But do you think the banks have that perspective? Because I, I'm thinking the natural tendency is to approach and say, can we, I don't know, buy, <laughs> can we buy you? <laughs> can well, we buy this company? Well, and if I you look at Amazon, Amazon provides uh, Amazon Web Services for many companies, including huge banks, and because they are very well positioned to provide that service. If you go as a bank to buy Amazon because of that, you kill that innovation, you kill that creativity. What we need is for the fintechs to continue to experiment because they have the way without to do so. They are not so big that if they fail uh, to drag so many things down. But again, they are so nimble that they can quickly figure out things and then you use this technology to provide a service to the bank to bring inclusiveness, convenience, and, and lower cost to more people. Uh, and I think that's a symbiotic, symbiotic relationship that I, I would want to see the banks uh, have with the fintechs. You know. Now, if you look at another area, the ATM, Shola and I were just okay. talking about the ATM. The ATMs are just being used as cash out. A lot of people go to queue for pensions, collapse in the queue. Meanwhile, these ATMs can do biometrics. So why, what stops a platform that uses the ATM to verify someone collects his pension. He puts his fingerprint, and along with the database, we're talking about big data, in the pensions uh, department or wherever, you see that this guy that is at the ATM has verified himself, he's verified, so he can even pay <coughs> his pension from the ATM that, mm. where he's standing. But that's what? certainly something to look 
th that is another disruptive area where you can use big data, artificial intelligence, and fintech. And the infrastructure for that, which is ATM, is already existing, except that we are not using it. Shall I get away on this? Yes, I, I totally agree with Austin's uh, uh, analogy of actually trying to merge fintech with uh, AI. Uh, if you look at our demographics, I mean, we have a young population. Uh, and in fact, in fact, Africa has a young population. Demographics speak to that way into 2050. And a lot of the millennials like to share, actually. So the mindsets are different. So fintech speaks to the millennials way of actually interacting with organizations and the way they would like services delivered to them. So coupled with that data that I spoke about and the artificial intelligence and now they're going to virtual reality and a few other areas, those speaks to consumers that are prepared to pay for those types of services. So it would be a proper business approach to collaborate with the fintech if okay. you are a current incumbent bank or to adopt some of their approaches because everything's moving to digital yeah, and absolutely. everything really the way the millennials act interact with their services is totally digital so right from the interface right to the back end has to be synced all together and i think technology enables you to do that so yep. I totally agree with where he stances and i think that it's now that the impact is going to be felt and will be felt even much more greater in the future. Okay, we have about four, three minutes left. Let's talk quickly about regulation this year. Uh, Austin, regulation, I mean, if we do pick up on the blockchain side of things, even for the FinTech also, how, would you, how do you see regulation affecting or impacting that in 2018? It, uh, it's an embargo that I've pointed out before. If you take Impesa in Kenya, mm -hmm. which is promoted by Safaricom, Safaricom is regulated by the Kenya Communications Commission, not the Central Bank of Kenya. So you have, uh, 40, uh, Mpesa does 40% of the GDP of Kenya. It passes through their payments, mon mobile money payment system. And then the hugest, biggest bank in Kenya is out of the regulation ambit of the Central Bank. Now, what we need to have is for regulation, the regulation to be clearly uh, outlined, between the fintech and the banks so that we don't have an embargo where major major banks are outside the purview. But if money goes digital and if there is no collaboration and therefore the fintechs are on their own and the banks are on their own, then that, uh, that could be a problem. Be a big problem. Huh. But, uh, well, I would like to talk more about that, but I quickly have just two minutes left. Shola, cybersecurity, you talked about the fact that there will, I mean, will be, should be, hopefully, solutions this year. Well, in terms of how we take that a step further, what, what, what do you envisage? Well, I envisage that a lot of biometric um, and iris, the eye, okay. I'll okay. just point to the eye, just in case no one knows what iris means, um, will be utilized. I think that uh, really regulation needs when to... When you say will be, are you talking regular companies? I mean, isn't that, because that spells to me money, as in... I think that well, in terms of uh, accessing certain, you know, we do the BVN at the moment and it's biometric. I think okay. there's a step further where Iris okay. could be used in conjunction with okay. biometric uh, uh, information to actually access your account, to do transactions, to actually interact with government. And I think that regulation has to keep up with that uh, adoption rate that's, okay. that brings to the play. All right, we're going to have to leave you there. I'm afraid we're out of time. But thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on Beyond Markets today. Thank you for your time. You. I've been speaking to Austin Okere, founder, CWG, PLC, and entrepreneur in residence at the Columbia Business School, and Olushola Teniola, president of the Association of Telecommunications Companies of Nigeria.